Now, get started. <clears throat> First, very important, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. I hope that your children have remembered. <clears throat> all of my children either sent me a card or have phoned or texted this morning, so that's nice that they still remember I'm their dad. <laughs> uh, Fatherhood is a big challenge, but it's also a wonderful thing as well. <clears throat> We're in 1 Peter chapter 1. When the bell rings, we'll take prayer requests and pray for uh, sick or grieving or whatever we need to pray for. But I like to get right into my lesson, get started with things. We're uh, covering 1 Peter, <clears throat> and uh, I have a blue sheet that's a syllabus if you didn't get one last week. Last week they were free, this week they're $5. <clears throat> it goes towards the Associate Preacher's Retirement Fund. <laughs> but if you don't, uh, if you don't have one, um, be happy to, uh, to share with you. <clears throat> I have my uh, green tea this morning, so I'm ready to go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 is what we're going to. I give names to each one of these sections. You'll see it on my, uh, on my syllabus. <clears throat> Martin, did you? And, uh, anybody else need one? If you do, I'd be happy to give it to you. I think I've got everybody who didn't get one last week. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens... Scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, which can pronounce, be pronounced about four different ways, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. This is a uh, really important book. And I mentioned last week I would like to challenge you to read or listen to 1 Peter every day. I uh, must say I'm proud of myself. I did it last week. I listened. Bible Gateway, you can listen or you can read in your uh, New Testament, whatever translation you prefer. And if you're doing it every day, I would recommend that you do read different translations. Read the King James one day, the New King James, New American Standard another day. Really helps in your understanding, I think, whenever you look at the different way the different scholars have uh, translated this message. So we have... Uh, we have Peter, and I wish these maps turned out a little bit better. I guess this one's pretty clear today. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, we forget sometimes that Eastern Europe, especially East Asia and Eastern Europe, are the places where the gospel was taken first. <clears throat> I forgot to turn my phone off. <clears throat> and it's my son calling me right now. But he's in a different time zone. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize for that. I usually turn it off and I didn't do it, but I'll have to catch him later. <clears throat> um, we forget that the gospel was preached a lot in the East in the beginning. It wasn't until later on that the gospel began to be preached much in Italy and then eventually in Spain and of course in other places as well. But in the East, the gospel was preached, as a matter of fact, most of the apostles in the study that I've done went to uh, some place in the East whenever they separated from Jerusalem. And uh, John, excuse me, Acts chapter 12 and Acts chapter 15, we have uh, the apostles finally scattering about in different places. And when they did, a lot of them went either south to uh, Egypt, to different places in the continent of Africa, or they went east and did a lot of their preaching and teaching there. So uh, Peter is talking about this. And I think that Acts, Galatians, Colossians, and Ephesians show us that Paul founded the churches in Galatia and Asia but uh, Paul did not, at least not directly, he did not establish the churches in Pontus, Galatia, and Bithynia. And so it very well could have been that Peter founded those churches or others went to the east as well. Uh, John Mark, or sometimes referred to in scripture just as Mark, he went to the east as well. 
So there's some conclusions we can draw about Peter's missionary travels. Luke records that Peter remained in Judea uh, until the persecutions of Herod Agrippa. If you remember, James, the brother of John, was executed by Herod Agrippa uh, by sword. He was the first apostle to die. Um, Peter was arrested and escaped, and Luke is a little ambiguous here. He says, to another city. We don't know where it is, but it very possibly could have been Antioch, because Paul and Barnabas worked from Antioch, and then later on we know from Galatians chapter 2, beginning of verse 7, that Peter had a confrontation with Paul. Uh, Paul confronted Peter about his hypocrisy in dealing with uh, the Gentiles. He had formerly eaten with them and now uh, some Jews came up from Jerusalem to Antioch and Peter played the part of a uh, hypocrite, Hippocrates. He uh, was a different person around those people. He didn't eat with them any longer. Um, however, Peter remained in Antioch, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, and it implies that Peter did work, the first verse does, uh, Jewish Christians living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, which are all in modern day Turkey. Isn't it interesting that 2100 years later, Turkey is mostly Muslim. So throughout the last 2000 years, uh, the Islamic faith has been the one that spread a lot in the East. In the beginning, it was Christianity. And of course, you do have the Armenians that border on Turkey, and they, are, um, uh, they were some of the first people that were taught the gospel back in the late 200s. And so you do have some people that claim that they are followers of Christ. Also, the first church historian, Eusebius, who wrote in the late 300s and early 400s, he confirms Peter's actual visit to these places in his writing called Ecclesiastical History, uh, chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. He says, Peter appears to have preached in Pontus, Galatia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, and Asia uh, to the Jews of the dispersion. Dispersion, of course, is diaspora, the spreading of the Jews. Uh, initially, it was the spreading of the Jews when they were persecuted by different groups, uh, Babylon, the Greeks, the Romans. But later on, after the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, of course, Jews were scattered uh, all over the world and, of course, became the subject of persecution all over the world. But Jewish Christians, it appears that Peter preached to them uh, from the historian. Uh, and eventually he came to Rome and he was crucified. And uh, we'll talk about that later on. All right, look at this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. So the question becomes, at the end of this first verse, who are those who are chosen? And we've got to be careful with that word. It's the Greek word electos or electois, if you're doing the plural. And the word elect means to be selected or to be chosen in some way. Now, we've got to be careful with that because there's been a lot of false teaching dealing with people that are elect in Christ. So we need to make sure that we follow the scriptures and do what it says. So to those who are chosen, our God has chosen for mankind, he's chosen them and he has drawn them to himself. So God chose the Israelites um, initially. In the Old Testament, First Chronicles and Isaiah, he's the God's chosen people. The Jews are, the Israelites. But that changed when Jesus died on the cross. There's a change of dispensations. Uh, you've got the patriarchal, you've got the mosaic, and you've got the Christian dispensation. Once Christianity started, then the situation is that we're to be followers of Christ. And we're to listen to the gospel and we become chosen people because of the gospel, not because God had a covenant with us 4,000 years ago. Okay. In the New Testament, God chooses obedient followers of Christ to be his people. I think 2 Timothy 2 describes that very well. But many people misunderstand the idea of human beings being chosen or being the elect. So uh, in studying this, and this is what I want you to do as well, if you would do this. I want to challenge you in this class, when you read through 1 Peter, that you try to think deeply about Scripture. 
A lot of times we have our kind of pat answers about things and we are a little bit superficial in the way we deal with things. I want to challenge you to think deeply about scripture. Scripture deserves to be thought and we need to drill down into scriptures and find out what they mean. So listen carefully to the next three slides especially. In purpose, and notice that I've used the word purpose. In purpose, God chooses everyone to be saved. God wants everyone to be saved. Jesus died for every human being that has ever lived. This is made clear in scriptures like 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish. God wants everybody saved, but for all to come to repentance. Again, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Salvation is, uh, what's a good word, available to all men. And Ephesians 1 and verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. We have been chosen. He chose us before the foundation of the world, he knew that Jesus was going to come, live a life on earth and die and be raised and go back to the Father. Now, watch this carefully, the transition I'm making. In purpose, every human is chosen, but in actuality, only those who obey the gospel of Christ will be chosen to be saved. All right, you see the transition here? In purpose, God wants everybody saved. In actuality, you've got to obey the gospel of Christ in order to be saved. I think Acts chapter 17 really sums this up because it makes three really good points in this verse. Now, when they heard this, of course, this is Paul in Athens. Uh, when they heard this uh, of the resurrection of the dead. Some began to sneer, sneer. That doesn't sound like they're really wanting to obey the gospel to me. Is that you? They're sneering. They're making fun. They're smirking at the message that Paul brought. So those people are not going to be chosen unless they decide to follow the gospel. They're sneering. Others said, we'll hear you concerning this. We're going to listen to you again. We're not convinced this first time in the message, but the message is good. We're going to listen to it again. So these people could be chosen. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Now in Acts and in other books in the New Testament, the word believed is a kind of a capsule of the idea of um, uh, a system of faith. It's not just believing Jesus. It's the whole other amount of things we need to do. We need to believe. But we also need to uh, confess Christ. We need to repent of our sins. We need to be baptized. And we need to be faithful unto death. If we do those things, we are chosen in actuality. And I think Acts 17 really drives that point home that some people are not going to be chosen. Some people could be in the future if they decide to follow the gospel. And some people joined him and believed. Among those were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So again, the actuality is in Ephesians 1.13. In him also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Notice what he says, having also believed. People who believe Jesus, that system of faith that brings people to the point of being saved and having the opportunity to be sanctified. If you've never been baptized, if you've never done, followed the system of faith, uh, sanctification doesn't mean anything to you. Sanctification is the process of continually doing what God, in other words, sanctification means you're reflecting the image of God in your life. That makes sense? <clears throat> Again, the actuality in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 2, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received. People who receive the gospel, believe the gospel, obey the gospel, those are the people that are chosen. So when Peter says, to the chosen, and he lists those five geographic areas, what he's talking about is people who have done those things. 
by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Okay? So 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 now. Went over verse 1. Let's start in verse 2. Notice what he says. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. I love these kind of outline verses, don't you? They're just wonderful. Notice how the work of the Godhead, uh, we usually use the word Trinity, that's Latin, um, in man's redemption are three members are mentioned in this verse. The Father planned our redemption, foreknowledge. The Spirit worked our redemption through sanctification, and Christ died for our redemption, sacrificial death, and that's the term that Peter uses. Being a Jew, Peter makes a lot of Jewish allusion, and he says, sprinkled with his blood. So uh, I love these verses that are outline verses. They're easy to teach, they're easy to preach from. So 1 Peter, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Foreknowledge has, uh, God has knowledge of things before they happen. I don't have that. Do you have that? Knowledge of things before they happen? Well, occasionally we might guess, right? But we don't understand about foreknowledge. The only time I'd have foreknowledge is, is if I were walking down a street and I saw a manhole that had the cover off of it and I walked on by and um, somebody fell into it and I said to myself, you know what, I knew somebody was going to fall into that because I saw it was open. I had foreknowledge of that. Well, that's not really good, is it? From the Greek, foreknowledge is the word prognosis. The lexical meaning is foreknowledge or forethought or previous determination or prearrangement or a purpose for something, prognosis. Now, all of us understand about prognosis, don't we? Because all of us have been to doctors. Many of us have been to doctors way too much. But what do doctors give us when they give us a prognosis? Well, they've studied for eight years. Surgeons have studied for 12 years. And so they give us their best guess. Isn't that why they call the doctors a practice? They give us the best guess. Um, I have a problem and I don't usually wear short sleeves because my arms are a mess. I've had skin cancer. I've had five different surgeries for skin cancer and the first one I had was right up here. And I didn't want it to, uh, the skin cancer to bother, bother my beautiful image of my face. And so I went to a dermatologist and uh, he said, you've got skin cancer. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, if we don't do anything about it, you'll be dead in five years. That was his prognosis. And I said, well, you know what? Let's do something about that. And so he did the surgery and he cut it off and, and it was terrible to look at for a week or two. I had this big old bandage on the side of my head and I was teaching high school at the time. And uh, you don't know me, but I don't miss very many classes. When I retired from teaching high school, I had 1,522 hours of sick time. I could have been sick for an entire school year and gotten my regular pay. I just don't. It was worse to miss and have to grade what the substitute gave them than it was just to go to school and do it. You know what I mean? If you've ever taught, you know what that means. So uh, prognosis. That word is a really interesting word. I think we understand it from doctors, foreknowledge. Prognosis is used only in two places in Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 and Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Whenever Peter again is preaching, logical isn't it? He uses it in 1 Peter. He uses it in Acts when Luke records his, his first sermon. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, prognosis is only used in those two places. Prognosis is so interesting. God had foreknowledge of Christ's crucifixion. Really important that you catch this next point. Watch it carefully. Simply because knew, God knew what course of action would be taken does not mean that God forced the person involved to take those actions. And listen to me carefully. I use this a lot when I'm teaching. God does not coerce. He's not going to make you do something. He's not going to force you into a box and make you do something. God doesn't coerce. We are in this life 
free moral agents. We have a choice. And sometimes the choices we make are not good choices. Amen? Amen. I mean, sometimes the world just comes up and slaps us in the face like a wet wash rag. Because, not because of something God did. Because of our own poor decision that we made. And now we're having to suffer the consequences for that. God foreknew that Jesus would be crucified. Very important. But Jesus had a choice. I love John. John's one of my favorite. Um, John chapter 10 and John chapter 11. Two of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Some people say you shouldn't have favorites. Well, I do. I have favorites. I love certain chapters. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Watch this carefully. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Jesus had a choice and he chose to come and die for us. And at this point, we should shout hallelujah. That's exactly what he chose to do. He made the choice. Jesus was a human being. He was a free moral agent when he was here. He chose to do God's will. He could have chosen to do his own will. Remember, uh, what's our song that we sing, Philip? He could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't do that. He didn't call any angels to help him. Jesus decided he would die on the cross. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Uh, this command I have received from my Father. So God the Father gave Jesus the Son the choice. And Jesus made the choice to die for us. A mathematician certainly foreknows when there's going to be a lunar uh, uh, or so solar eclipse. But he doesn't cause the eclipse to take place, does he? He just knows it mathematically. Uh, starting from Copernicus on, we know that. Christ died for us as individuals and foreknew Jesus died, uh, therefore Jesus died for the church. We are the church. Now here's a really important statement. Listen carefully. Think deeply about this. The church was not an afterthought of God. God planned for the church in advance. What's important? Why is it important to know that God planned for the church? Why is that important that he planned for the church? What's that? If it, if it failed, then God made a mistake. God didn't make a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. Whatever conclusions you draw concerning uh, the book of 1 Peter, God must always come out perfectly clean. God doesn't make mistakes. But there are people in the world today who have made billions of dollars over this millennialism problem that they have. And it comes in different forms, premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. But it talks about the fact that when Jesus came the first time, he did not do or accomplish everything that he was supposed to accomplish. He wasn't supposed to die at that point. And the result of the Romans killing him at the hands of the Jews is what? Well, he didn't get a chance to establish his church. So when Jesus comes back this second time, they say that during that thousand year reign is when he's going to establish his church or his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, that is false doctrine. It is important for us to understand God didn't make a mistake. So it's important to know that God planned for the church to come into existence. Jesus died for the church and the church, as one of my old professors would say, be us. I know it's bad grammar, but it's the truth. We are the church and God planned for us to be the church. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. The sanctifying work of the Spirit, very important. The salvation of each individual takes effect by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. To sanctify is to make holy. The word holiness and the word sanctification come from the same Greek root word. By the way, I wanted to mention something to you. I, I said it briefly last week, but I will say, I will only use, most of the time, 
99% of the time, you can figure out what God wants you to know from the English. But there are times when the Greek really does help. Sometimes it's no help. Sometimes it's a lot of help. And if it's a point that it's a help, then I'm going to use that for you. And I'll explain it uh, very well so that all of us can understand it. But sometimes it really does help to do that. In this case, holiness and sanctification come from the same Greek word. To be holy is to be set apart. For God and thus reflect his nature. Art and Gingrich are uh, Greek dictionary or lexicon. And uh, I really like their statement about what this word means. God goes to, once we have become Christians, reflect the nature of God. God doesn't expect us, if we're not Christians, to reflect his nature, to reflect his nature. Okay? Once we become Christians, he wants us to reflect him in our lives. So the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, teaches us how to reflect God's nation. In other words, we're to act like God would act. And so all of this business about 20 years ago, what would Jesus do, is really valid. It really is. What would Jesus do? Sanctified people would act like Jesus would act. Of course, it became a commercial thing and people made a lot of money from it. Where do we need, uh, where do we read how God would act in a given situation? Let me tell you, go back everyone, just every once in a while when you do your own devotional reading and read the Sermon on the Mount. Let me tell you what, that's a really good place to start because God asks us to do things that are just not natural. But that's how God would act and that's how we need to act. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Therefore, sanctification is the process of becoming holy like Jesus is holy, okay? Sanctification is the continued process of being made perfect in the love of God and the removing the desire to sin. That's a really important sentence. We need to reflect God in our lives and the way we do that is we remove the desire to sin from our lives. And we do that by more than just reading and studying the Bible. Pursue peace with all men and sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. I'm sharing with you this morning, you gotta be sanctified or you're not gonna see Jesus or you're gonna see him in a really bad situation, Revelation chapter 20 in that white throne scene whenever he judges you and you get thrown into the lake of fire. Sanctification is absolutely essential. It is just as essential as someone being baptized into Christ. Sanctification is the process by which after we become children of God, now we learn to reflect God and remove the sin from our lives. And so uh, one person obeys the gospel and then the process of sanctification should begin. Sometimes I think we go to extremes in the Lord's church and we just talk about the knowledge of uh, the word of God will take care of everything. Well, we need to pray. We need to have Bible study. We need to worship. How many times have I said when I've been preaching or teaching, worship is the most important thing that we do. Giving and fellowship are all part of the sanctification process. Doing those things on a regular basis. The purpose of spending time in God's word, folks, is not to make us smarter sinners, but to make us more like our Savior Jesus. Amen? Amen. I mean, we need to study God's word, but it's not just, well, I know the answer to that. So what? Are you more like Jesus? That's what we need to be. First Peter chapter one and verse two, according to the foreknowledge of God, the father, sanctifying work of the spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Sprinkling of the blood comes from the Old Testament. You all know this. Many of you have been in the church for many, many years. No need for me to explain that. Uh, the high priest would take the blood uh, once a year. He would go on a Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement would go and offer blood sacrifices, uh, the blood of bulls for himself and for the nation of Israel. And it was sprinkling of the blood. And that's where Peter gets this idea is from the Old Testament. God promised to uh, bless and forgive Israel if Israel would obey him. Exodus 24 verses 1 through 8. God expresses his choice of Israel by means of a covenant which Moses took the blood and sanctified the animals, uh, sanctified uh, sacrificial animals and sprinkled the blood on the altar and the other half of the people sealing their commitment. I, I really like that phrase a lot. I wish I'd have read it better. Uh, be sprinkled with his blood. 
It's by means of the sacrificial death of Christ that being chosen or being elect is even made possible. If Jesus didn't die, we can't be chosen. Christ's death and the shedding of his blood made our reconciliation to God possible. Romans 5 and verse 10, for a while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <clears throat> Talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. Hebrews 9, 12, uh, not through the blood of bulls and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once uh, for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. Uh, Hebrews 10, by the way, Hebrews 9 and 10 are wonderful if you want to study the, the chan transition of um, Old Testament to New Testament. Let's approach God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. First Peter chapter one and verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy, I don't know about you, I don't want God's justice. I want God's mercy. I make too many mistakes to want his justice. I want God's mercy. How about you? You want his mercy? Has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I love that. It's not a dead hope. It's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. According to his great mercy. I think uh, Ephesians chapter 2 is another one of my favorite chapters. But God being rich in mercy. Oh, thank you, Father, for being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, we we're made alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Thank you for your mercy, Father. Has caused us to be born again. The idea here is that God, through the sacrificial death of Jesus, has mercifully saved us. Okay? Um, the verb here means to beget again. We normally translate it born again. It literally translates beget again. Um, and it's interesting because it's used again only here and in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Only two places in the entire New Testament where it's used. It expresses the change of lifestyle. Are you listening to God's word? It expresses the change of lifestyle that results from the work of Jesus on the cross for us. It's the death of Christ culminated in his resurrection that causes us to be begotten of God or to be born again. Okay? <clears throat> so, when we obey God by the system of faith, we're begotten by God or born again. Believing, confessing, repenting, being baptized, living faithful. That's what system of faith talks about. By the way, if you've ever, if you want to do an interesting study, look up the word faith and see how many in different ways it's used in the New Testament. Several different ways. Our obedience confirms God's uh, participation in our new God-given life. The, uh, this act of God is bearing upon our salvation, is here recognized as a manifestation of God's abundant mercy. Because we've obeyed, we can take advantage of God's mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Caused us to be born again. Peter's idea is that when a person is saved, they're made a new creation. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. When we are converted people, we need to become different from the world. That's the point in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. So let me ask you this. Are you different since you obeyed the gospel? Do you act like the sinful world or are you different from the world? I had, uh, I had an old professor one time uh, say it a different kind of way. He said, uh, let me see if I can find the exact quote here. <clears throat> I have notes, but I try to work with them without having to read my notes. <clears throat> So you've been a Christian for 30 years. Have you had 30 years of growth as a Christian? Or have you had one year repeated 30 times? Wow. That kind of spells it out, doesn't it? We need to be, no, long, no matter how long we've been Christians, we need to keep growing, keep moving, keep studying, keep praying, keep giving, keep worshiping. We need to continue to grow and reflect God in our lives. 
<clears throat> Salvation would not be possible if Jesus was not raised from the dead. I think that's probably a given for us. First Corinthians 15, 12 through 17. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, we're still in our sins. But hallelujah, Jesus is raised from the dead. Amen. <clears throat> All right, to obtain an inheritance. I don't have any rich uncles, do you? Do you have any rich grandfathers, aunts, uncles, second cousins, somebody's going to leave you a pile of money? I don't have that. I do have an inheritance from God that's imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Isn't that great? One of the things we hope for and anticipate is our inheritance. Being begotten by God produces a secure inheritance. Hope lives because it rests in the inheritance that will never fade away. This is significant contrast to any inheritance on earth. First of all, if you get a big pile of money, you're probably going to spend it anyway. Right? Some people will save it. It's imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. Uh, when, you buy, when husbands buy flowers for their wives, highly recommended, by the way, they know those flowers will have to be replaced in a week or so because those flowers are going to die. They're going to lose their beauty. But they will wilt. But our inheritance will not grow dimmer or weaker or go away. Right? I must confess that I love having reservations. I don't know about you. I love having reservations. Dinner reservations, reservations for vacation. Is it verbo or VRBO? I, I, I don't know. Something has changed. Somebody told me it's VRBO, but now we're getting fancy. It's verbo. <clears throat> Reservations to be at the symphony. Uh, haven't done that here yet, but uh, Lisa and I sometimes take a Mozart night or a Beethoven night and uh, we go and, and listen to the symphony. It's wonderful music. Um, reservations to a baseball or football game. It's nice to walk in and know that seat is yours. You've paid for it. Anybody else is in it. You get an usher to come and get them out because that's my seat. I bought it. It's reserved for me. That's the same way as heaven. If we're faithful unto death, we have an inheritance reserved in heaven. That's a reservation I don't want to miss. I don't know about you. I want that reservation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, we're protected, and we got to be careful with that word. We're protected by the power of God through faith. We're kept there's another way to translate that, protected or guarded. It's a military term. And thus we're preserved through our entire lives by nothing less than divine power in order that we may safely reach the goal of full possession. I want to possess my reservation in heaven. God's power is the garrison in which we find our security. And we got to be careful with that word. We are kept by the power of God, but it's through faith. Watch Peter carefully. We're kept by the power of God, but it's through faith, and it's our faith. We've got to be faithful. If we're faithful, heaven is there. The reservation is there. The inheritance is there. If we're faithful, waiting for us. <coughs> Amen? I mean, this is powerful stuff from Peter, and we've only gotten in the first five verses. He's going to curl your hair later on. Got some really good stuff in there. You ladies won't have to go get a perm. I'm telling you, Peter's going to curl your hair. We could say that our faith activates the preserving power of God in the life of Christians. Don't you love that? Our faith activates the preserving power of God in the life of a Christian. So what does kept in a state of security mean? God is faithful. I love that he's faithful and we are faithful, then our home in heaven is secure and nobody can take it away from us. Romans chapter 8. Don't you love Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 8? Wonderful chapters. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a reflection of what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, right there. We're protected if we're faithful. God is going to give it to us, what he promised us. God promises us, and he never, ever goes back on his promises. 
Salvation is the object of the believer's hope. This will be realized when Jesus returns and the Christian dispensation ends. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you, when Jesus comes back, it is the judgment. It's not a thousand years for you to do better and all of a sudden you're going to be saved. When Jesus comes back, it's judgment. He came the first time to save. The second time he's coming is to take the saved to heaven who have that inheritance and people that are not saved are going to bear the consequences of that. I, boy, that's pretty good. I got through the whole thing today. I'm really pleased about that. That's good. All right. As I promised, as I promised, we would, uh, 